Little sends chills down the spine of a lot of people than snakes, especially venomous varieties. In most cases, there's little to fear, but armed with knowledge, your chances of an unpleasant encounter should be greatly reduced and the risk to your personal safety eliminated. It's important to understand that all the creatures we'll be discussing fill an important niche in the environment, so please avoid killing snakes as they really benefit us all. I, I, don't, I don't think people should kill venomous snakes or any snakes. Um, years ago, farmers on their property used to kill snakes, and they noticed the rodents were eating more of their grain and, 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 and their crop and stuff, and they finally realized that snakes are good, and they, they keep down the rodent, they keep the rodent population in check. And most snakes, are, all snakes are, are basically afraid of us. They only bite us in defense, or if we step on one, if we molest one, they're, uh, they're afraid of us. And, and if you give them an opportunity to, to escape, 99.9% .9 of the time a, a venomous snake and a non-venomous snake will, will go off in a different direction. There are over 3,000 species of snakes on the planet, but only 15% are dangerous and are found on every continent except Antarctica and every state with the exception of Alaska, Hawaii, and Maine. Venomous snakes found in the U.S. include copperheads, water moccasins, coral snakes, and numerous species of rattlesnakes. Contrary to popular belief, venomous snakes are not a significant human health or safety issue, and living with these snakes is really no different than being around wasps or bees. If you come across a wasp nest, and avoid disturbing it, you should have no concern. The same also goes for snakes as well. The vast majority of people bitten by snakes are the result of doing risky things, such as trying to kill, handle, or even take a close-up photo of them. You may think doing so is crazy, but it happens time and time again. Each year there are about 48,000 incidents of snake bite in the U.S., and of that number, about 8,000 are from venomous varieties and, on the average, only 10 to 15 people die. However, it's important to compare that knowing that far more people die from stinging insects such as bees, wasps, scorpions, and fire ants. An important piece of knowledge is that about 40% of the time, people who are bitten experience a dry bite where no venom is injected. A recent study determined that 44% of bites occurred as the result of accidental contact, such as stepping on the animal, and more than 55% resulted from grabbing or handling snakes. First of all, if you don't know, leave it alone. Secondly, even if you do know, leave it alone. Lastly, if you think you're quick enough, you're not. In the United States, there are types of venomous snakes, rattlesnakes, water moccasins or cottonmouths, copperheads, and coral snakes. It's a good idea to know how to identify the venomous snakes. So let's take a look at some of the common physical traits that distinguish them from non-venomous varieties. With the exception of coral snakes, all other North American venomous snakes are considered to be pit vipers, which include rattlesnakes, water moccasins, and copperheads. That is to say, pit vipers have a deep facial pit between the nose and eye that acts like a kind of heat-sensing radar, helping to locate prey. Pit vipers have a distinct, thick, triangular-shaped head with a rather narrow neck and elliptical, cat-like pupils in their eyes, short, sturdy tails, and or rattles or buttons in the case of rattlesnakes. Of course, these snakes carry fangs that can exceed an inch and a half that fold back until extended forward during a strike. The amount of toxicity of venom can vary as well as the amount. For example, the western diamondback rattlesnake can carry nearly four cc's of venom in its arsenal. Others may carry less volume, but are far more toxic or destructive. Most pit viper venom causes massive tissue damage, attacks the circulatory system, and in some cases affects the nervous system. Here in um, the state of Texas, we have several venomous snakes. Most of them are all pit vipers, except for the coral snake, which is an elapid. That's a fist. They have a fixed fang and they're closely related to cobras. All the pit vipers have fangs that fold up against the roof of their mouth. When they open their mouth, their fangs swing out and they go in and they fold back in. Those are the pit vipers we have, and that's a hemotoxic poisoning, basically a blood poisoning, kind of marinates the muscles and everything, where the coral snake is a lapid, is a neurotoxin, which uh, compresses the breathing of the chest cavity, and basically it, it, you can't breathe anymore. 
number of states have a species of coral snake that can easily be misidentified as a harmless king snake. There's a poem that some people use to help to identify them, which goes something like this. Red on yellow, kill a fellow. The problem is remembering the poem correctly. Making a mistake with a coral snake can be deadly, as their venom is similar to a cobra's. The smart move is to avoid this snake altogether, and of course never handle one if you think it is a king snake. The coral snake, um, you know the old nursery school rhyme, red touches black, good for Jack, red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow. Uh, I have a coral snake bracelet that I always wear, and you see where the red touches the yellow. That's the best way to do it. But the best way, if you see a bright, colorful snake like this, is just to avoid it altogether. But like I said, they are an unlapped snake, and they don't really strike. They bite on something and they chew. Well, when they're chewing, their saliva has that neurotoxin in it, and that's what gets enters the bloodstream. Snakes can't regulate their body temperature, therefore are less active during cool weather. But they can come out at any time, day or night, if it's warm enough for them to be active. But they tend to stay in when it's much below 50 degrees. Conversely, in very hot weather, they can overheat and die if they can't find a cool place, such as a shaded area or bush. They can be just about anywhere. It's up to you to keep on your toes. So, it's temperature, not time of day, that determines activity. Some regions don't have much of a temperature differential between winter and summer, so you could see snakes just about any time. Uh, snakes are ectotherms, and what they do, that rely on the ambient temperature outside. Um, when it's cold and stuff, they'll go underground or underneath uh, cover like sheet metal, plywood, wood, uh, logs out in the field, rotted trees, anything. And then, when it, of course, when it warms up, they can, they'll come up above ground and bask in the sun to warm themselves up because they are cold-blooded. There are 16 species of rattlers in the U.S. that can range in size from the small pygmy rattler to the massive eastern diamondback that can reach 8 feet or more. With so many species of rattlers, be sure to gain an understanding how to identify those in your region. Rattlesnakes are well known for their distinctive rattle on their tail. However, young rattlesnakes can't make this sound until their second shed when another segment appears. But it's important to remember that rattlesnakes sometimes don't rattle prior to striking. Uh, Sometimes when you startle a rattlesnake, uh, yes, they, they do not rattle. Uh, the rattle basically is a warning, is a defensive warning. It means, I am here, leave me alone. Um, they thought the rattlesnake, the rattle evolved from, uh, for a rattlesnake, from cattle and stuff in the wild, would, would, would come up on them and walk on them and stuff, and the rattle evolved from that and they would warn, you know, cattle or any kind of hoofed animals, that, hey, I'm here, I'm in my presence, don't come near me. Of course, the, the louder the buzz, the closer you got to it. And it was a warning that other animals picked up that, you know, danger sign. But you can startle a rattlesnake if, or if he's asleep. Um, and you walk up on one, if you, or if you're hiking in the woods or camping or whatever, you step on one, yes, I mean, they, they don't necessarily have to rattle before they bite, warn you. But the 90% of the time they do warn you if they're alert and are awake. Young venomous snakes generally don't know how to meter their venom. Therefore, if bitten, you may receive a full dose. In addition to the shape of the head, most rattlers have distinctive diamond patterns in the scales along their back and often have black stripes on the tail. But some species, such as the speckled and tiger rattlesnake, have different patterns that blend in with their environment. So it's important to do a little research and become familiar with rattlesnakes that inhabit your area of the country. We suggest going to the internet for specific information on venomous snakes in your location. Water moccasins or cottonmouths are highly venomous snakes that are usually found near water such as swamps, ponds and other bodies of water. They are also pit vipers with a heat sensitive organ for detecting warm blooded prey. Young water moccasins are generally a pale reddish brown with dark brown bands edged with white. As this snake ages, the colors change to a blotched or unmarked olive or brown or even a blackish color in older specimens. 
The average length is from three to four feet with occasional six-footers. Water moccasins are often found resting on branches overhanging water or swimming through the water and often try to enter boats. If startled, this snake gives a visual warning by bearing the white interior of its mouth, giving it the name Cottonmouth. It's important to know that this snake can be quite aggressive in defending itself and is quick to strike. They were called cottonmouth uh, cotton or trap jaw for a lot of reasons because when you come up on one, if they're coiled, the first thing we'll do, their defensive mechanism, unlike a rattlesnake, rattles their tail, they'll throw their mouth open, they'll expose that white lining on both their mouth. That's where the cottonmouth came from. The copperhead is the most common venomous snake in the eastern United States. These snakes usually range from 24 to 42 inches in length and are quite colorful with a pinkish or tan hue, with a distinct hourglass pattern on their backs, and, of course, get their name from their distinctive copper color on their triangular head. Young copperheads are colored similarly to adults and have a bright yellow tail. Copperheads can be found in a variety of habitats, though often prefer to be near bodies of water and forested areas with leaf litter that blends with their natural camouflage. These snakes often remain still when danger approaches, making them more susceptible to being stepped on. When agitated, a copperhead may vibrate its tail in the leaf litter and vegetation, producing a kind of rattle sound. Copperhead venom is not as toxic as many other snakes, and bites are seldom fatal. However, a bite can still produce a serious medical condition. Copperheads are probably our least venomous snake we have in the United States. Their venom toxicity is fairly low compared to a cottonmouth or western diamondback rattlesnakes. Um, they are very, very common. They have an hourglass pattern on them, and it's, it's a copperish color. It's what they call copperheads. Also, um, they blend real well in with dead leaves. They were the master of camouflage snakes out of all of them. When threatened, a venomous snake typically draws its body into a defensive tight S-shaped coil. However, it's important to know that a snake does not need to be coiled in order to bite, and a strike is far quicker than human eye can detect. A snake's head will constantly face its threat with its body shifting as necessary to maintain visual contact. Ordinarily, a strike can cover a distance between one-third to one-half of the snake's length. So as a rule of thumb, a three-foot snake has about an 18-inch strike range. A four-footer might reach about two feet, and so on. So be sure to maintain a safe distance. Snake venom is a specialized form of saliva designed to begin digestion before swallowing its prey. Venom may contain a number of toxic and other destructive properties. Toxin levels can also vary from year to year and season to season, with venom typically stronger in summer when snakes are more active. Venom is excreted through modified salivary glands on each side of the skull behind the eye. When a bite occurs, venom is pumped from the venom sac through tubular fangs into its victim. Venom may contain hemotoxic, neurotoxic, or cytotoxic properties, or a combination of these depending on the species or subspecies of the snake. Hemotoxic venom is designed to assault the circulatory system, destroying blood cells, preventing coagulation, and destroying the blood vessels. Neurotoxic venom disrupts the ability of nerves to function properly and transmit messages causing numerous effects, including the ability to move and breathe, affects the heart, and can cause paralysis. Cytotoxic venom causes serious destruction to any tissue it comes into contact with, resulting in significant tissue death. You may be asking yourself, if I'm bitten, will I die? The short answer is no. Today, there are few cases that result in death as medical treatment for envenomation has greatly improved. Provided that medical treatment is sought immediately, a person bitten by a venomous snake should make a full recovery without significant lasting effects. A bite from a venomous snake usually results in a bloody wound from fang penetration in the skin and swelling at the bite. The pain is usually very severe and burning, but may also be numb or have a tingling sensation. The victim may experience a rapid pulse, weakness, dizziness, fainting, and convulsions. 
There also may be symptoms of profuse sweating, thirst, loss of muscle control, nausea, diarrhea, and vomiting. Here's an important thing to remember. Venom can remain highly toxic even in a dead snake or even a preserved skull for many years, so handling a deceased snake is a very bad idea and may cause accidental envenomation. First of all, try not to panic as this will only cause the venom to more rapidly migrate from the wound. Remember, snakes will often dry bite for defense, so take a deep breath and let your adrenaline rush subside a bit before you act. A bite will usually leave two well-defined puncture marks and there will be immediate severe lasting pain. It's important to remain calm and get help as soon as possible, so call 911 or go directly to an emergency room. Providing good first aid care is important. After a bite and you're in a safe location, wash the bite with soap and water and immobilize the area, keeping it lower than the heart. Cover the area with a clean, cool compress to minimize swelling and discomfort and monitor vital signs such as heart rate and breathing. If unable to reach medical care within 30 minutes, the American Red Cross recommends applying a bandage wrapped snugly two to four inches above the bite to help slow the venom. The band should be loose enough to slip a finger under it so as to not cut off all circulation. Never use a tourniquet as this prevents blood flow from arteries and veins which can create serious problems. A suction device, often included in commercial snake bite kits, can be placed over the bite to help draw venom out of the wound without making cuts. However, these devices are of questionable effectiveness and never but never cut the site or use your mouth as venom can enter your body through the tissues of the mouth. You may have heard that applying DC current such as from a car battery will reverse the effects of the venom. Well, it doesn't work and the application of electricity is dangerous and highly painful. Your best choice is to stay calm to reduce the movement of venom and get to medical assistance as soon as possible. Again, with advances in modern medicine and anti-venin treatments, deaths are uncommon. Antivenins are classified into two types, monovalent, which are effective against a specific species, and polyvalent, that is effective against a range of species at the same time, such as rattlesnakes. Most snake antivenins are administered intravenously and bind to and neutralize the venom, halting further damage, but does not reverse any damage. Remember, never try to capture to kill the snake to show the doctor, as most regional anti-venom treatments may not require knowing the exact species of snake. I was bit at a zoo I worked at um, about 20 years ago, um, manually shedding the, the, the snake that had some stuck shed on it by a western diamondback rattlesnake. I pinned it and I grabbed it behind the neck before it doesn't bite and it jerked out and turned around and bit me on the thumb. The pain was immediate, a burning, stinging sensation and throbbing and then, then after maybe 30 seconds it felt like your hand was slammed in a car door, best way I can describe it. The pain was, it was that intense, swelling eventually over the next four or five hours went up my arm, crossed my chest cavity down my other arm. I waited too long to go to the hospital, I didn't think the bite was that severe. And when I finally did go to the hospital, like 12 hours later, they said they couldn't give me any antivenin because the venom was well within my system. Antivenin wouldn't have helped that time, so I had to like sweat that one out. And that was a tough way to go. If I ever get bit again, I know immediately to go to the emergency room. If working where there may be venomous snakes, there are a number of things you can do to avoid contact and being bitten your company should consider developing a plan in the event someone is bitten. Have an idea where they may be hiding before starting work. Keep your eyes moving, looking for areas where snakes may hide. Listen for movement, hissing, or the telltale rattling of venomous snakes. Snakes usually pick up the vibrations from walking, so always wear sturdy shoes with socks, as well as long pants or snake chaps, especially when walking in grassy, brushy, or rocky areas, and never put your hands or feet anywhere you can't clearly see. If you turn over a rock or other object, turn it toward you, keeping your hands and face on the backside, never reaching over it. If a snake is in your path, don't step over it 
walk around it. Never try to catch or kill snakes. This may sound obvious, but most snake bites occur this way. Newcomers to the field or novices or people out collecting snakes and um, if they get bit, the best advice I can tell you is not to do the old cut and suck, um, you know, the venom and, and spit it out because if you have any mouth sores or ulcers in your mouth or anything or a cut in your mouth, what you're doing, you're just putting the venom right back into your system. The best thing to do if you're out and you get bit is get yourself a, a set of car keys and get yourself to a hospital. If you can drive yourself, if you can't have someone else to you, don't try to cut because you're just doing a lot of mechanical damage and you're going to cut other veins and other thing and, and nerves, you're going to lose a lot of feeling. You're going to do actually more damage in the long run than what the snake bite would be originally. As you've learned, the risk of snake bite is really quite minimal and there's a lot you can do to avoid being bitten. Remember, most bites are the result of someone handling or harassing snakes, and you know how to avoid placing yourself at risk. The key points to remember are, learn how to identify the snakes in your region. Be on the ball at all times, scanning for places where snakes may be hiding. Watch where you step and place your hands. Have a plan in the event someone is bitten, and of course, know the first aid procedures to limit venom spread and control tissue damage and get to medical care as soon as possible. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Be sure to learn as much as you can about snakes and their natural history in your area. For the more you know, the safer you'll be.